So here we are with the third Oklahoma African American Family Film Festival. It uh, lends itself to uh, a place uh, in the history of Oklahoma that really is rich and needs to be told and needs to be shown in such vivid manner as possible, technically speaking. And so uh, uh, we look at it as being a fortunate place here at the Oklahoma History Center as a place to uh, come and uh, sort of dust off your boots and your roots and feel at home uh, and learning of your uh, history uh, that blacks have uh, uh, so richly participated in and uh, uh, written on a day-to-day -day basis. So here we are uh, in the midst of uh, the third annual Oklahoma African American Family Film Festival and many more to come. And we're fortunate to, to uh, be able to uh, archive these uh, projects uh, at the Oklahoma History Center. And uh, so it's a great motivation also. To, the product is, uh, is of, uh, of quality, uh, high quality, and of the truth. And uh, you know, history is not history if it's not the truth. So we just say thank you and uh, for uh, participating, watching, or listening to this particular uh, edition of the Oklahoma African American Family Film Festival and participating in the future film festivals. Hello everyone, my name is Trey Thompson and I'm the Executive Director of the Oklahoma Historical Society. I would like to welcome all of you to the Oklahoma African American Family Film Festival. In Oklahoma we have a rich tradition of African American Oklahomans who have contributed to the Western arts, whether it be from rodeo to uh, cowboys and outlaws to the Buffalo Soldiers. We have Cherokee Bill Goldsby, who was a notorious outlaw during the late 1890s. Bill Pickett was a famous bulldogger and invented that sport and is now a member of the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame. Bass Reeves was born into slavery and later became a famous lawman in the Indian Territory. We have so much to celebrate here and throughout this film festival you're going to have an opportunity to learn about these folks and many many other people who contributed to this way of life in Oklahoma. So I thank you for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful time. Greetings. As an OHS Board of Directors Emeritus, I bring you greetings. The Oklahoma Historical Society Black Heritage Committee is a subcommittee of the Oklahoma Historical Society Board of Directors. The sole purpose of the Black Heritage Committee is to reach out to African American communities and towns to collect, to preserve, and to share the rich heritage of individuals who have contributed to the heritage of the state. February is the Black History Month, the month that the Black Heritage Committee focuses on bringing special programs and events to the attention of all people. Although we continue to work throughout the year to focus on Black history, because Black history is Oklahoma history. So sit back and enjoy this month's third annual Oklahoma African American Family Film Festival. Thank you.
Now, Ms. Rector, your case has been summoned to the history court because it has been brought to our attention that some people have never heard of you. Please state your name, birth date, and place of birth. My name is Sarah Rector. I was born March 3rd, 1902, in what was called Indian Territory, in a town called Twine, Oklahoma, now called Taft, Oklahoma. I'm of Creek Indian descent, and in 1913, I was known as the richest colored girl in the world. Looking at these newspaper headlines, it says, oil makes Piccanini rich. Would you mind explaining this to us? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you. When land was allocated to the five civilized tribes and the freedmen, my no account piece of land turned out to be an oil gusher. <laughs> Everybody wanted my money. White people didn't like a brown-skinned girl like me being rich. They called me all kinds of names, wrote me letters asking for my money. I decided I would spend my money the way I wanted. I was known all over the world. I see. They wanted your money so bad. According to the headlines, Oklahoma law made you white. Now, Miss Rector, can you please help us to understand what in the world were they talking about? Keep looking, man. Cause this guy ain't got shit. Ooh, looky here. I like that. Yeah, I like that a lot. <laughs> that is fine. Look at that. That's mighty fine. Take it easy with them guns. What you doing pointing that gun at us, boy? Oh, me so sorry, sir. But we filed in the war for the North. So all that massive stuff, well, I don't pay it no mind. We 
We didn't kill him. Oh, I know you didn't kill this one. I did. So what, you coming to collect? Oh, I don't want no trouble. I just, I want what's fair. Fair? What, 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 what would you consider as fair? Well, the way I figure, one of us takes the money, one of us takes his stuff. What about his horse? I got a horse. We'll take the money. Deal. Might work out after all. Oh, I don't see why it wouldn't. The way I see it, we all on the wrong side of the law. We all need to look out for each other. Why don't you put that head splitter down? I'll put mine away after you holster yours. Now, you know, if I wanted to kill y'all, I could have done it already. Good. Now we can be civil. Thanks. Y'all mind if I check the body? satisfied with what I got. No need to be greedy. Say, do I know you boys? Y'all sure look familiar. Nah. Just getting through the territory. You sure y'all ain't a couple of famous outlaws? Uh, John Tula. Fred Keen. Who's asking? Bass Reeves. U.S. Deputy Marshal. <laughs> Ain't no black marshals, boy. <laughs> Ain't that a hoot? Good choice.
We had a lot of African Americans in this area prior to statehood. Espanico, for one, was documented by friars. Bernard de la Harpe came up to this area from New Orleans. He had two slaves in his employ. There were documentation of campsites along the Arkansas River in Muskogee and McIntosh County. In 1819, you had Thomas Nuttall and he documented African-Americans some of some influence in this area. Major Long had an expedition and Major Jacob Fowler also during this time were on explorations. Fowler for one had Paul with him who is documented as shooting a deer while he was searching for stray horses. Also he must have had his own money because he was allowed to bid on some vest of a deceased soldier. Peter Coulter is a wonderful person to find out about. He was on his second tour, and he was free black people from Marion County, South Carolina. He came up to Bell Point and over to Fort Gibson. The Bean family, a lot of people know about from down in Choctaw, Chickasaw country, but the five were captured over in the Creek country, taken to Van Buren, David escaped, but that had another court case come up because they were already emancipated in Illinois. Charles Latrobe and Leavenworth also were operating in the 30s. George Catlin was with Leavenworth. In the 40s, we had the first cattle trail coming through called the Shawnee Trail. They had black cowboys with them. Better known is during the Civil War, you had the 11th Arkansas, the 54th Arkansas operating in this area. You had the first Kansas color, which is known real well in Oklahoma, and the second Kansas color. In the 80s, you had a large number of deputy U.S. Marshals, best known of all is Bass Reeves. They operate out of Fort Smith, McAllister, and Muskogee. Cannon, Miller, Factor, Mayberry, Fortune, and Grant Johnson just to name a few. We have a wonderful history, but you have to search for it. Anything else? I'm going to shut her down. Nope. Good deal. All right. That shook my bone, boy. Golly. Shoot. Hey, what are we going to do if the storm get worse? Maybe worse like a twister or something? Yeah, something like that. Well, we'll just go hunker down out back. That's a stupid plan. Nah, man.
What's your name, friend? You got a name, right? Most of us do. Why? Did I cause some offense? Nah, nah. I'd like to know who I'm speaking with. Well, my name is John. Friend. And I'm a straight shooter in every sense of the word. You know what I mean? Well, John, mm. one of these days that straight shooting's gonna get you killed. Guys, one time said the same thing. <laughs> oh, shoot. Uh, what was the outcome of that? Well, since you asked. <laughs> I went down there. Did what I had to do. Killed them both. Then collected my bad You know? <laughs> yeah, I see. Maybe that sort. Sure am. That storm is right behind us. Y'all got a place for us to keep our horses? Yep, yep. Right up back. Five cents a head per day. Good enough. Roy, find us a nice place to sit. Show me what you got under there. We want this table. No. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing I was just thinking. Because I want this table as well. That's the reason why I'm still sitting here looking at you. Let me place it different. We need this table. I see all you gonna find tables that you guys can accommodate, if you know what I mean. Move. Or what? So you're gonna let these very 
likable. Folks, come in here and take my table from me. Well, John, is it? You say you're a straight shooter. Shoot him straight. Kill me too? That's right, boy. This is none of your business. Oh, where I'm from. Cold blooded murder. Well, that's everybody's business. Looky here, boys. Looks like we've got ourselves a Concerned citizen. <laughs> <laughs> and just how do we treat concerned citizens with the utmost respect? gets any more out of hand, why don't y'all just let me explain who I am and why I'm here. Stop! Now ain't none of this gonna go like y'all think. And just how do we think? Oh, you think I'm killing everybody in this room? Getting back on the trail? See, now that, that right there, that's real introspective of you, good citizen. And, exactly right. But hey, as your dying wish, why don't you just tell us who the hell you are and what you're doing here? Who I am? It's Bass Reeves. What I am? as a United States Deputy Marshal. As to why I'm here, well, I'm here for you, Ben Carver. I'm here for you. Now, I probably got warrants for the rest of y'all, so why don't we just work this whole thing out? That's either real brave, Real stupid of you to tell us who you are. Regardless, I can't warn you and not us. What if a man can do it? I can. And if a man can't, I still can. And by the way, these two, they're with me. And they can die with you. Ha <laughs> 
Go on, boy. Kill me. No, I'm not gonna kill you. It's gonna teach you a lesson. Just because you can, don't mean you should. You coward. You yellow belly tenderfoot. You're dead. You don't kill me right now, you're dead. And the world will have one less dumb. <laughs> Sometimes you should. Greetings. My name is Art Burton, and I'm here to talk about Black Cowboys, Outlaw, and Lawmen of the Oklahoma Frontier. Glad to have you with me and uh, try to make this as informative and as enlightening as I possibly can. The African American presence in Oklahoma goes all the way back to the fur trading era when the French, who first came into the Indian Territory, worked the fur trade and they brought African slaves with them. Then when the five civilized tribes came to the Indian territory, they brought African slaves with them. And those who came with them were very versed in cattle industry, which they had done in the Southeast, in Florida and Georgia and Alabama. And they worked as a uh, cowmen. Uh, this was at the same time in East Texas, they had uh, African slaves who worked the cattle industry in East Texas. So Eastern Oklahoma and Eastern Texas is the genesis of uh, black cowboy as we now know them. And many of the black cowboys became very famous in the Indian territory uh, within the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek and Seminole nations. The uh, first person I like to speak about would probably be Daniel Walker. Uh, the most important cowboy in the history of Oklahoma is known to be Will Rogers. Well, Daniel Walker was the foreman 
on uh, Will's father's ranch, Clement Van Rogers, and Daniel Walker was a Cherokee freeman. Will had no playmates to play with, and Daniel had four or five boys that Will played with. And Daniel, being an expert rider and roper, taught Will how to rope. Uh, Will took those skills and became very famous and uh, took him to the Ziegville Follies and later take him, took him to Hollywood where he became a national star. And so he learned uh, his uh, skills at the hand of a black cowboy in Oklahoma by the name of Daniel Walker. That's a very important name to remember. Uh, the next cowboy I like to talk about is uh, Bill Pickett. Bill Pickett was originally from Texas, but he came to Oklahoma and he worked on the 101 Ranch. The 101 Ranch had a large Wild West show that Bill participated in. And Bill had learned how to throw bulls by biting them in the lip. And uh, he would jump off his horse, grab the bull by the horns, turn his head upwards and bite him in the lip and the bull would fall to the ground. And this was the first aspect of bulldogging. And now it's a rodeo sport known as steer wrestling. But Bill Pickett is a legendary cowboy of such. Another cowboy, black cowboy, that was very famous on the 101 Ranch was named Knox Simmons, Knox Simmons. And Knox was a very good roper. And uh, he was a freedman, uh, he, uh, Choctaw, Chickasaw Freedman, and uh, he was very light in complexion. And he uh, went with the 101 Ranch to the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair, and he won a roping competition. And they didn't know that he was an African American. And after they found out that he was an African American, they took the award away from him. But he was also a very popular a very skilled black cowboy. Uh, coming up into the 20th century, there was a black cowboy up at Cleo Springs, which is near Enid, Oklahoma. And he had a, a very prosperous ranch and he put on the rodeos in that area for many years in the 1920s and 1930s, Jess Howard. And he was very, very good and became very popular and he was wealthy enough that he would loan money to uh, people in that area if they needed money, either black or white, and uh, was very well known. Uh, coming up into the 1940s, 1950s, many people say the greatest black rodeo cowboy was a cowboy from Adabel named Marville Rogers, Marville Rogers. And, uh, I got a chance to see him myself when I was a youngster and he was outstanding riding either bulls or broncos. And he used to have a choo-choo ride where he would light a cigar and every time the bull hit the ground, he would throw his smoke up in the air from the cigar. And a lot of people loved it and uh, was quite popular within the rodeo uh, industry in Oklahoma and Texas and around. Uh, Marville Rogers, another name we should definitely remember. So there was a lot of uh, black cowboys in Oklahoma. As Oklahoma had 40 black towns, the larger black towns had rodeos. And in the early days, Bowley is uh, seen to have one of the earliest black rodeos and it's still going on today. Uh, there was another black rodeo that was very large, not in a black town, but it was in Drumright, Oklahoma. And that was where the rodeo uh, finals were held for black cowboys when segregation was in effect. And they had another rodeo that started in 1950s at Oak Mogi. So the rodeo tradition was alive and well in Oklahoma. Now looking at the frontier, one of the aspects is law and enf enforcement and uh, criminal justice uh, as it related to African-Americans in the Indian Territory, Oklahoma Territory. Uh, some of the people that we have to talk about who were very active in terms of keeping the peace were the Buffalo Soldiers. And they were stationed at numerous forts in the Indian Territory 
uh, primarily at Fort Gibson, Fort Seal, Fort Reno, Fort Supply, and that was the 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and 25th Infantry Regiments. Uh, and they did a yeoman job and they were there throughout the years of the territorial era in Oklahoma. Um, if we talk about outlaws, uh, there was a number of African-American outlaws during the territorial era. Uh, the first one that became uh, very well known was Dick Glass and Dick Glass had a gang uh, that would rob horses and take the horses into Texas and trade the horses in for bootleg whiskey, bring the bootleg whiskey back into the territory by barrel, not by jug as most people did. He brought it back by barrel and he made a lot of money. At one time, his gang was supposed to have been 11 men. I believe it was supposed to have been something like uh, five blacks, four Indians and two whites. It was notated, but uh, Dick Glass was in quite a few shootouts and he was eventually killed by the Indian police, uh, the United States Indian police around 1885. Uh, but Dick Glass was the most famous black outlaw of the 1880s. Uh, the next cowboy, uh, actually a cowboy of the 1890s, most famous black outlaw was named Cherokee Bill. His real name is Crawford Goldsby. Cherokee Bill was his nickname. And he was notated for robbing banks, stagecoaches, and banks. And uh, he had a brief career that lasted about approximately two years. But uh, he was executed at Fort Smith, Arkansas in 1896, uh, before he was 21 years of age. But he gained legendary status as an outlaw in the territory. He was followed by a gang, the Rufus Buck gang, that was also from the Creek Nation. And uh, they went on a rampage of rape, pillage, and murder for approximately 13 days, turned the Creek Nation upside down in 1895. And they were caught by the deputy U.S. Marshals and Indian police. And uh, they were taken to the Fort Smith Federal Jail in uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. And they were all hung on the same day, uh, five of them. And uh, it was very tragic. Uh, short life, and they, they chose uh, a, a wicked way to live. Uh, there were many other black outlaws. Step Odie was a famous black outlaw in uh, the Choctaw Nation. Uh, Buzz Lucky was a Creek Freedman outlaw, and he was notated for robbing trains in the Creek Nation. Uh, there was an outlaw, a black outlaw from the Cherokee Nation named Bill Nail in the early parts of the 1900s. And uh, there was two black outlaws from the Creek Nation, the Tabla brothers, who were notated as being the only federal executions uh, in Wichita, Kansas. And Wichita had federal jurisdiction over a portion of Indian territory at one time. And they were executed in Wichita, both Joe and Jake Tabler. And uh, those are just some of the uh, criminals that we can talk about. The Light Horse Police is also very interesting because there were black members of the Light Horse Police, especially in the Creek Nation and the Seminole Nations. Uh, also, the Seminole Nation had uh, Dennis Cyrus, who was a Creek Light Horseman for 25 years. Uh, Caesar Payne was a very famous uh, lawman. And in the Creek Nation, we had Tacky Grayson and uh, Wallace McNack who were outstanding uh, police officers in the Creek Light Horse Police. Uh, for the federal jurisdiction, we had the Deputy U.S. Marshals. The first one of note that uh, came to four was 1872, a uh, veteran of the Civil War and uh, former Buffalo soldier, the 10th Cavalry Regiment, Bynum Colbert. He started in 1872 and he worked up till 1896. The next deputy that followed him would probably have been Bass Reeves, who got his commission in 1875. Bass became legendary. Uh, he's the only deputy that I found worked from 1875 up to Oklahoma statehood in 1907. Uh, he became renowned. Uh, people were singing songs about uh, his exploits. He arrested thousands of criminals. Uh, 
probably the greatest frontier lawman in the Wild West, Old West, as we like to call it, was Bass Reeves. Uh, truly outstanding. He was followed uh, by Grant Johnson, who was a Creek freedman, and uh, he started approximately in 1888, and he worked up to uh, around 1906, and a uh, pretty long career, about 22 years. He was notated as being one of the best deputy marshals that worked for the Fort Smith Court, and later transferred into the Indian Territory, as did Bass Reeves. Uh, Rufus Cannon, who started approximately 1890, had an outstanding career. He helped capture and kill Bill Doolin, one of the most outstanding outlaws of the Oklahoma Territory. Uh, Bill Colbert, who started about 1880, was an outstanding Black deputy as marshal. He worked uh, about approximately 25 years as a posse man and as a deputy as marshal. And then we had Robert Fortune in 1895. He started and he worked up to statehood in 1907. Robert Fortune was very interesting because he later became a lawyer and uh, he was a lawyer at Chickasha, Oklahoma, uh, became quite well known. Then he moved to Phoenix, Arizona and was one of the top uh, black citizens in that town up till his death. Uh, but uh, the black deputy US marshals were very unique. It was never anywhere in the United States where you had such a large group of black deputy marshals. Uh, between 1875 and 1907, there were upwards of 50 black deputy US marshals in the Indian and Oklahoma territories. And they did an outstanding job at uh, keeping the peace. Uh, the one deputy that everybody talks about because he was so outstanding was Bass Reeves. And I was glad to be able to do the research and bring him to people's attention in terms of what he was known for, what he was able to do and what he accomplished. Uh, it was very interesting. Bass was illiterate, being a former slave. He couldn't read or write. He would memorize his warrants. He'd have somebody read the warrants off to him. And he would uh, compile a list of at least 30 at a time. And in those 32 years, he was a deputy U.S. marshal. Never did he bring in the wrong person due to the fact he is illiterate. He had total recall in terms of memory. He, his tracking skills were renowned. He worked in disguise to catch people. You know, he would uh, dress up as a bum, as a preacher, as a cowboy, uh, as a farmer, whatever he had to do to catch people. And uh, Bass Reeves is just uh, a true American hero someone that we can all celebrate and uh, look back and, 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 and glory in his accomplishments. And hopefully as the years go on, his uh, persona will just come bigger and bigger. Those are just a few people that uh, we should be aware of. African-Americans made a huge contribution to the frontier era of uh, Oklahoma and uh, I'm just glad I was able to partake and uh, be part of this presentation, and I hope you enjoy it. The Okmulgee Invitational Rodeo is noted as the nation's oldest and largest African-American rodeo. It leads Oklahoma's African-American rodeos. The LeBlanc family promotes this premier sporting event. The Roy LeBlanc Invitational Rodeo recently celebrated its 65th year of rodeo history. My dad was a calf roper, and he roped back in the, I guess the 50s. Him and 21 other black, uh, I guess, uh, citizens around Oak Muggy, and some of them were teachers, some of them were business owners and stuff, and they're the ones that actually started the Oak Muggy uh, rodeo. They named the rodeo, the, it was the Oak, the Oak Muggy County Roundup Club is what it was. And it was an open rodeo. I mean, whites could compete in it at, at, when we first started. Anybody could compete. And then in the 70s, Coors came along, and they were often added money to the rodeos. And after that, so many people were so, I guess, overwhelmed that there was 
such thing as black cowboys and that there were so many black cowboys that we kept it an invitational rodeo. And it's a, and that's why it's the old Muggy Royal LeBlanc Invitational Rodeo today. Bowley, Oklahoma was the largest of more than 50 all black towns in the United States. It is home of one of Oklahoma's oldest black rodeos. The Pioneer Town showcased the talents of many black rodeo champions. The Cowboys performed in parades and competed as bull riders. Today, Roundup clubs support the rodeo parades. The Bowley Rodeo is still known for its exciting performances. Bowley was the largest and most prosperous of the black towns in the United States. We were declared a national uh, landmark in 1975. As far as I know, uh, Bowley would be the oldest black rodeo. They had what was called a carnival. And this, this rodeo was part of that, that carnival um, type entertainment. Bowley has been ro involved in rodeo ever since the showing of Crimson Skull in uh, 1922. Uh, Bowley supposedly had the uh, best mounts and those are the horses. They rode faster than the wind. The Eastside Roundup Club is one of the oldest annual rodeos in Oklahoma. Eastside Roundup Club is one of the Roundup Clubs of black organizations that, as far as getting together with riding horses, going to the rodeos and different parades from state to state, anywhere from all the way from Kansas to Oklahoma City to Dallas and Lawton. I mean, just, we just used to travel all over just going to parades and rodeos. And then before the rodeos, they have a club to come in and set the pivots. That's what mainly what we do. We come in and set the pivots for the, to set the stage for the, for the rodeo. The roundup clubs are more or less to, to get the kids to even just to get to know the horses. Before you can be a competitor, you got to get to know the horses. The roundup clubs are more or less, I told you, like a social gathering, people with families getting together like any other thing. The history of black cowboys have been overlooked and unrecognized for years. In fact, some people are still surprised to learn that Oklahoma has a long history of black cowboys. In the rodeo world, black cowboys have now become a major contributor to championship competition. Oklahoma has some of the most skilled and talented cowboys in the rodeo world. Rita Cooksey is an all-around champion cowgirl. She's a champion barrel racer and a champion steer undecorator. She is the first female rodeo producer of the historic Bowley, Oklahoma Rodeo. She's also been a rodeo queen. Rita Cooksey is from Oklahoma City. She grew up in a rodeo family that has a long line of livestock traders and rodeo entrepreneurs. She's been a cowgirl all her life. She's been a volunteer with the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum for over 25 years. She's a producer and mentor of a rodeo camp for children designed to teach them about horses and the rodeo life. My dad would always let me ride a horse and sometimes the horses would tell me what to do and then daddy would say, no, you have to tell them what to do. And then at that time, mostly the girls couldn't do hardly any of the events. At least I didn't know that until later. But so I became a barrel racer. And Dad let me try out several horses till we finally had got one that was pretty good, one of his race horses. My dad also did, did uh, horse racing as well as livestock trading. And that little horse took me all over the country and I made more money rodeoing than I did working. Wow. So I worked for insurance. I rode over for money. <laughs> but I had a friend that asked me to come with her and join the All Girls Rodeo Association. And I didn't even know Oklahoma had an All Girls Rodeo Association. It was right around me all the time, but until this person, Diana, invited me, I had no idea. The girls rode the bulls. The girls rode the bucking horses. They did all the events that the men did. And once I got there and the competition was a lot stiffer, 
I became a lot better competitor. I went on to win the all-around cowgirl at the Bill Pickett Rodeos. I was able to mentor children through grants, through the nonprofits, to strangers I didn't even know. I was able to start rodeo camps, and I primarily went to the, the black towns first. Um, started out with Eastside Roundup Club, and we taught the kids how to lead a horse at halter. Something that, you know, you have to start first leading the horse where you can even get on them. And somebody, I have no idea, showed up with barbecue brisket for about 100 people, beans, the whole works. So it became quite a successful program. I also took it to Arcadia, and it continued all the way into the last couple of years, of course, with the, the uh, changes with the virus. But I've had people now that are still interested. I've been the rodeo producer at Bowley, Oklahoma for the Bowley Rodeo. Uh, it did rain out in, in 2019, but in 2018, I got a call and said, we need some help. I've worked with the Bowley Chamber, and I was able, with their assistance, to put on probably the largest one-day rodeo Bowley's had in a long time. We went to 3 in the morning, added $5,000. And my cowboy friends and cowgirl friends also supported me with that. Women are in the world of rodeo. We've always been in the world of rodeo. And my mom started out clearing the water around because that's all she could do. But at that time, but times have changed. So seeing more and more women in this industry at top level positions. Milton Cooksey is a horse trainer, a bareback rider, a team roper and a bulldogger. He's also the owner operator of the Flaming Three Arrows feed store in Oklahoma City. In 1996, he was the only black operator out of 2,600 Purina dealers in the entire country. Milton is also a racehorse owner and breeder who trains quarter horses, paints, and thoroughbreds. Money-wise, it's changed. There's more people of color stepping into these different areas, from rodeos to the horse racing. Um, the horse racing end of it there's still a handful, but the rodeo it, it's changed over the last 30 years to break some of the barriers and the stigmatisms. Uh, towards I've been able to go places that most people of color haven't been able to go. I've rodeoed in Mass Square Garden and be the only person of color there. I've gone to the big races and be one of the few so it, it's, to me, it's about opening doors, and I've been able to deal with all nationalities, all races. Alan Cooksey is a horse trainer and bull rider on the collegiate circuit. He's a member of the U.S. Team Roping Association, and he's a mentor to beginner ropers. My family has been involved in some form of rodeo or with animals for three or four generations. Uh, my grandfather on my daddy's side was a horse trader, cattle trader, and livestock hauler in eastern Oklahoma and, and uh, western part of Arkansas. Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side was uh, what they called goat roping, which they had back in the 40, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, couldn't afford, black people couldn't afford care for care for open, but they'd have weekly goat ropings on Sundays all across basically the eastern part of uh, Oklahoma, mostly around Oklahoma and Tulsa area. Depending on what part of the country you're from, like Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, everybody knows there's black cowboys and all that, and even some parts of California. But other parts of the country, they've never heard of black cowboys. I, I mean, even now, nowadays, I'm still running across it when I go somewhere like, or meet some people from Illinois or, or New York, New Jersey, and they're just, you know, astounded that there's so many black cowboys, you know. And, and they're all, we've had black rodeo champions. Uh, we've had, uh, e even uh, if you look back in, 
lots of black people in the days of segregation. There were big time farmers and ranchers, but you never hear anything about that. It's changed in that uh, as we were growing up and younger, everything was, blacks only went to uh, black functions or rodeos. Uh, now, we're able to go anywhere and do the same as anybody else. There's more blacks doing it on a professional level. Uh, we still have a long ways to go, but uh, there's more of them getting involved. There was uh, at the uh, Professional Rodeo Association finals, there was two black uh, guys in the calf roping, and one of them won the world championship. And he's the uh, guy named uh, uh, Mayfield. He's the second black guy to be the calf roping champion. Uh, there was a guy named Charlie Sampson. Uh, he was the first black uh, bull rider in that association, and the only one so far. And even on my level, on the amateur level, uh, used to be at the team ropers, it was just my brother and myself there. And now we're seeing more black people uh, involved in team roping and, and on our own, on the amateur level. And uh, it's not unusual to, you know, six, seven, or eight, which still are not a lot, but it's getting there. Danny Cooksey is a horse trainer, calf roper, and a member of the U.S. Team Roping Association. He's also a mentor, instructor for beginner team ropers. I uh, followed my father around because he was a calf roper and he would go to the rodeos, uh, to different places, and we'd be right there with him. And we listened to the calf ropers talk about their horses and what they were doing. Was, you know, we got Oak Muggy Rodeo, Eastside Rodeo, and uh, little functions around uh, Oklahoma. They would have Oklahoma City or Green Pasture. Well, there seem to be more places for people to go. More uh, people are putting on functions for people, jackpots for people to go to, uh, which are just individual parts of the rodeo, just maybe team roping or just maybe calf roping. And more people seem to be more knowledgeable about it now. Because it seemed to be progressing, so I can't say it's, it's uh, anything needs to be changed because people are changing it all the time. They're just getting better. and. There's more producers putting on functions for people to go to. And uh, the, I guess the biggest part I didn't like is the traveling. If you have to do a lot of traveling, so there's more in our area for people to go to, you know, within a certain mile, 100 mile limit, you know, and you can enjoy yourself, unless you just like to get on the highway. Trail ride is kind of like a wagon train. It's when people come together and they they all talk about what they do. You know, horse riders are people that's, if you listen, everybody's got a story. So when we get together, that's what it's all about. A lot of times we have 100, 150 people, riders, and that's it's a pretty good little train when you're going down the road. I don't know, most people, when they think of trail rides, they really don't know what to think if they haven't been on one. Like I say, because everybody got a different opinion of it and what part of t the state that you're in, it's kind of different. But once they find out that you're riding off-road and it's more of a challenge ride, and then it becomes more interesting to them, you know, because they want to know if they can make it, if they can ride. And then we got a beautiful scenery. You've seen the lake and all that. And, you know, we're just kind of building on it, too, because we've uh, cleared a lot more property 
made a wider view. And, you know, we try to, when we take people out on trail ride, we try to let them enjoy themselves, you know. And, and most of them did. They enjoyed the scenery, the views, and then the ride. I get comments about the ride all the time because we go through real trails, hills, creeks, sharp embankments, narrow edges, over the logs, you know, and you, it, it sharpens your skill. And that's what our trail ride is about. So the young could come, the old could come, anybody can come and have a good time. You know, I encourage a lot of people there in the community, just bring your kids, you know, ride the hayride. We got a hayride, right? we sit and eat lunch, you know, they get to go to the lake, they see all kind of sceneries and, you know, you get to meet people and just like an Audi. So see, in the city, I can remember I was probably about three, four years old, maybe. And uh, my dad, we, we rode a horse, you know, out of Spencer. That's when it was a lot, a lot of country. You know, wasn't really no, no pavement out there. We rode, we was on the country mile, and I remember that horse. It, it bucked and bucked, and I cried to get off and get off. He never would let me off that horse. And uh, I still remember that to this day, you know, at that, that time. So since I was little bitty, uh, I always been on the horse. But I, I never forget that time. My dad said, you, you ain't getting off. Yeah, you ain't getting off. Hey, hey. My grandpa, he, he, uh, he purchased the land. And then it went through my mom, and then I end up on it now. So it's been in the family for quite a while. And then the community where we were riding is called Warrior Community. And it's been there for years. The old school up by the house, it was like an 1897 school. And that was one of the first schools that I went to. Matter of fact, the first. That area there has got a lot of history. A lot of history. This area down in here is known for uh, our cowboys, bulldoggers, uh, horse deer wrestlers, calf ropers, bull riders. You know, we, we've had them all come from right here in Shakota. Why do you think that is? Uh, it's just, I don't know, somebody says it's the cowboy capital of the world. Marvell Rogers was one of the first black cowboys to compete in the professional rodeo Cowboy Association. He broke into the rodeo business in the 1950s when rodeos discouraged black men from competing. He was known as an all-around cowboy, but his specialty was bronc riding. Rogers was from Idabel, Oklahoma, where he started rodeoing at age 15. Over the years, People recognized him by his trademark because he always smoked a cigar when he rode. In those days, black cowboys could only get paid for money collected in the passing of the hat called the hat collection. Rogers competed and always got his pay from the hat. He was an inspiration for many black cowboys to break into rodeo. Arthur Stoner, was the first black world champion bareback rider in pro rodeo history. He taught himself to ride Bronx when he was 14 years old and started on the pro rodeo circuit in 1990. He grew up in Oklahoma City. Stoner 
was the International Professional Rodeo Association's world champion bareback bronc rider in 1991, 1992, and 1994. He didn't compete in 1993 because of injuries. He was ranked fifth in the world in the all-around cowboy competition, which ranks rodeo contestants who participate in more than one event. Stoner's career was cut short in 1995 when he was killed in a car accident. He was 25 years old. Cleo Hearn is a calf roping champion and founder of the Cowboys of Color Rodeo. He was the first black cowboy to attend college on a rodeo scholarship. He's from Seminole, Oklahoma. He roped his first calf when he was 12 years old and entered his first rodeo when he was 16. Hearn became a member of the Professional Rodeo Cowboy Association in 1959 and the first black cowboy to win a major calf roping event in 1970. Hearn, known as Mr. Black Rodeo in cowboy circles, is the driving force behind the Cowboys of Color Rodeo, which honors black cowboys of the past and showcase the talents of the new breed of rodeo athletes participating today. He put on his first black rodeo in Harlem in 1971 to over 10,000 kids who had never seen, heard, or read about black cowboys. Since then, he's made it his mission to educate and inform people about the story of the forgotten cowboys. Today, Hearn is one of the most sought after black rodeo historians and producers in the country. Steve Rieger is the first black in history to win a college rodeo championship. He won the National Intercollegiate Rodeo Association's calf roping title in 2003 while attending Bacon College in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Rieger's win gave the college its first rodeo championship. He said he got into rodeo because of his dad. I was just raised up rodeo and that's kind of like all I knew. I didn't know anything else beside rodeo because uh, my dad you know, he, uh, him and his brothers and the whole Rager family just kind of grew up rodeoing. And uh, my dad said they was going to rodeos like when he was a kid. And he grew up roping goats and stuff like that and going to the big old muggy rodeo because that was the town he was from. So um, uh, it's just like a part of me. That's kind of all I knew just growing up. I thought it wasn't nothing but rodeo. It's, it's not a poor person sport. Um, you have to have push behind you. And the main thing, you gotta have the talent to get started. But um, if you got those sponsors, that just makes it 10 times easier. You know, it's, you know, it's, uh, you're not as worried. Uh, when I was rodeoing, uh, guys were asking me where was I going in June and July. And here we were in March and April. I'm like, hey, <laughs> I'm just trying to get to May. <laughs> And I was rodeoing all of, off of this right here. Clue, I knew African Americans had made the college finals, but I had no clue that I was the first. And you know, after I won it, uh, I definitely didn't, didn't think it would be, you know what I mean, this long uh, and ongoing. But uh, before, before yeah, another black uh, came in and won it. But I, it's, it's a heck of a heck of an accomplishment. If you're rodeoing and you, you're competitive, it's really no off days. It's really no off days. You've got to be exercising your horses. You've got to exercise. Uh, you got to practice. I mean, every opportunity you get because if you ain't, there's somebody practicing getting better while you're slacking. Derek Goff is an American Quarter Horse World Champion Qualifier. In 2002, he won the American Quarter Horse Association World Championship. He's currently the only black cowboy in this area. Goff has a long list of accomplishments, but calf roping is his favorite. Well, my actually, I started roping my uncle, my mom's brother roped calves, and uh, he started me to roping, and it just kind of took off from there. They gave me my first rope when I was two years old. 
and I would rope the dummy out in the front yard all the time, and they just kind of started from there. And I wrote my first calf off a horse when I was uh, 13 years old, and just kind of took to it. And uh, my father-in-law, he had quarter horses when I got to be a little old. I was probably in my late 20s, early 30s, and uh, he wanted me to show some, show some horses for him that I was taking to the rodeos. And uh, I made the world show four times on three different horses. The traveling, the traveling is the hardest part. Because if you rodeo full time, you're gone all the time. You know, you got guys that leave in around the first of June and they're gone until September. And then you got guys like me who rodeoed, I'll leave on a Thursday and I won't get back home until early Monday morning. You know, so the traveling is the biggest, the hardest part of it, being gone all the time. The first thing I do is tell them to get with somebody who's who knows the business. Because you got to know somebody who, because Somebody like me, I had a lot of good teachers, just like Nelson helped me a bunch. You know, I rodeoed with uh, Kenneth LeBlanc. I went to some rodeos with him when I was younger. So I always would get in the truck with somebody who knew what was going on and tried to learn from them. You know, I would tell them to you know, get in with somebody who knows and don't go at it blind. You know, get in with somebody who knows and try to pick up on the knowledge they know when they show you and they'll show you how to get around and how to enter. You know, just don't strike out by yourself. Try to get with somebody who's, like we say, been there, done that. That way you don't have to take the long route. They can show you all the shortcuts and things. Nelson Jackson is a longtime cowboy that's been in the rodeo business more than half of his life. He is a member of the first rodeo organization ever created for black cowboys, the American Black Cowboy Association. He is a calf roper and a bulldogging expert. See, when I come along, they didn't have but about five or six black rodeo, okay? And 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 I was the outsiders, because, see, I was all new at it. All them guys, that, just like my kids, they come up rodeoing. And so, you know, and they, they judge you. So them judges would favor them guys they know in, in the point you know, when you're riding. And then when I went to the white road, the same thing. With no blacks, didn't hardly go. There were two Metcalf guys. The Metcalf, they last thing, Benny Metcalf and a, and a, what's that one name? Uh, 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 I don't remember them, but uh, Clyde. And they could really ride. And and they wouldn't let them ride till after the sh performance, till after the show. I'm talking about back in the 60s. Clarence LeBlanc is the first black world champion steel wrestler. He's from Okmuggy, Oklahoma, and he's a member of one of the state's oldest black rodeo families. He won the International Professional Rodeo Association's World Champion Steer Wrestlers title in 1983 and again in 1990. He won the National Steer Wrestling Championship in 1994. Over the years, his achievements only increased. Well, basically, I grew up in it. My dad rodeoed, his dad rodeoed, my uncles rodeoed, and uh, I just grew up following them to rodeos and fell in love with it when I was a kid. I loved riding horses and everything. Well, I, I started out roping calves, you know, when I was smaller, and uh, my big goal was to go to Old Muggy Rodeo and win something every year. You know, they had several black rodeos around at that time when I started, you know, they had like one in drum ride, one in bowling, and there was three or four you could go to every year, and that was the big deal. I wanted to go to those and rope calves, and uh, at, when I got older and when I got to college, I uh, was roping on the rodeo team at OSU, and uh, some of the guys out there were steer wrestling, and I thought, man, I can do that, so I I tried, it wasn't too successful at first, but <laughs> I was determined to learn how to do it. And once I learned how to do it, I just fell in love with it. That's all I wanted to do. And uh, I just worked really hard at it because I could see myself improving and I just wanted to do do better and better. And I just worked at it like crazy. And uh, we were fortunate, we always had an arena right in the backyard. My dad had an arena when he wrote Cas, and then we just changed it over and started steer wrestling in it, you know, me and my brother Kenneth, we'd, we'd go out there and practice and steer wrestle and different guys would come by and we'd learn a little bit from everybody, you know. And uh, when I got, after I got out of college, I went to Kansas and started, uh, I went to work for Kansas Beef up there. I was an inspector 
And uh, a friend of ours from Texas, they used to come to Old Muggy's Rodeo every year by the name of Calvin Greeley. He was one of the few black cowboys that was professional at that time in the International Professional Rodeo Association. And uh, he kept trying to get me to go rodeo with him. And I didn't know if I was good enough because I hadn't been to any of those rodeos, you know. And uh, finally I gave my boss a leave of absence up there at, at uh, Kansas Beat. And I took off and went with Calvin. And uh, I didn't go back to work for 16 years. You know, you, you're trying to beat everybody there to, to win enough to so you can go the next weekend and, and keep going. And it's just a constant drive. You got to be motivated to practice every chance you get, keep your horses in the best physical shape they can be in, ready to go with any, you know, when you go. And uh, it's, you know, you train just as hard as a football player would if you want to beat everybody, you know what I mean? And I wanted to win. You know, uh, I, I did about everything I wanted to do, you know, in rodeo, and, and uh, I was able to do it for a long period of time. One of my greatest achievements was like, I was the first black steer wrestling champion in the IPRA, you know, and I won it twice. And uh, I made the finals, uh, I think 19 times over the period of time that I was rodeo. Last year, I got an award from the association, which meant a lot to me. Uh, all the members of the association uh, voted, votes on this uh, to decide who was one of the most deserving cowboys over, you know, his lifetime in the association, and they voted me that award last year. Ronnie Fields is a world champion steel wrestler. He holds the Black Hills Roundup record with his 3.3 second run from 2004. Fields, who grew up in Tulsa, was also the International Professional Cowboy Association World Champion Steel Wrestler in 2000, 2001, and 2002. Gerald Vaughn is a World Champion Steel Wrestler. He made the International Professional Rodeo Association Steel Wrestling World Finals twice, in 1996 and in 2007. He was the IPRA Southern Steer Wrestling Champion once. He placed in the Bill Pickett Invitational Rodeo National Standings as Rookie of the Year and won the Bill Pickett Invitational Rodeo Martin Luther King Champion of Champions in Steer Wrestling in 2007 and in 2008. He's from Muskogee, Oklahoma. My dad rodeoed, and uh, I've always rode horses since we was little bitty, and uh, we just kind of grew on us. The rest of your family, I'm like your sisters and brothers, they... My uh, grandpa, he rode bareback horses, and uh, my daddy, he, he bulldog, and I had a brother, he was pretty good. He he still wrestled too. Then he quit. He hurt his knee and got too big. Uh, my next to the oldest sister, she just started out running burrows. Didn't play with it a whole lot. Just kind of dilly dallied, and it just kind of fizzed out. Uh, with me, it just stuck. So That's I mean, good. we just kind of grew up in it. That was it. So. Was there one person that maybe inspired you or one person that taught you to do what you do now? Well, my dad showed me how to, taught me how to bull out. But there was a lot, lots, and lots of inspiration. You know, uh, one of my heroes is Currents. Uh, Currents and uh, Pee Wee, you know, I traveled with them and they taught me how to win. Uh, I had a cousin, Alfred Alfred Bullock, really, really good. So it was a lot, I was just surrounded, lots, lots, just in and out, That's in and out. But uh, with, with uh, Clarence and, 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 and Pee Wee, just what his name is Kenneth, we all call it Pee Wee, they just changed everything. You know, it's, it was more mentally, more determined and, and technique, and because I ain't very big, so we had to we had to learn to do it right in order to compete. 
toughest part of this business to me is uh, staying humble, mentally, and you gotta be you gotta be determined. You gotta stay focused. Well, I mean, it's so easy to get caught up in it, and 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 you got to want to not just be out there. You gotta have some some drive, and uh, if you don't develop that drive, you just you just never move. I have a background of, of wrestling. So I wrestled in junior high and high school, so, and, and steer wrestling is kind of a leverage deal. So it was a lot easier for me to transfer over. Because when I was wrestling, you had to learn discipline, and you had to be gritty, and you had to be mentally tough the whole nine yards. So in a way, it kind of prepared me for what I was doing, so it just, piece of cake, you know. Danelle Tipton is the first black world champion bull rider. He grew up in Spencer, Oklahoma, and rode his first bull when he was 13 years old. He joined the International Professional Rodeo Association in 1992 and made the finals, finishing seventh in the world in 1993. Tipton is a two-time international finals rodeo champion. In 1998, he joined the Professional Rodeo Cowboy Association and won the Rookie of the Year and the Bull Riding World Titles. Danelle Tipton was inducted into the National Multicultural Western Heritage Hall of Fame in Fort Worth, Texas in 2015. You know, when you, when you crack out and you, you started going to these pro rodeos, um, you compete and you travel around the world to try to qualify for a finals. Well, at the end of that finals, they crown a world title, a world champion, uh, due to the high money earnings of, of the top 15 guys that qualify for the finals. So every finals, I have a top 15 guys in the world that try to qualify. So they might get to about 120, 130 rodeos a year to try to get to that number one spot. In 95 and 96, I was crowned a world champion. Uh, bull rider because I had the most money one and I was the baddest bull rider in that, that year. <laughs> My mom's side of the family rodeos. Um, I was I was raised up um, around rodeoing from day one. Um, I rode in parades with the Oklahoma City Paraders. Um, the Tipton family um, was the founder. My grandfather was the founder of Oklahoma City Paraders, uh, which is Lloyd Tipton. Uh, my great grandfather, and so when I got old enough, turned two or three years old, I was riding my my Shetland in parades and stuff like that. So, at the age of eight years old, my mom, my grandmother, my grandfather, my whole family rode horses. My brother, we all rode in parades. Coming up in the ranks as a kid, you know, I would go behind the bucking shoots at the rodeos and just sit on the fence and watch them bull, bulls and bucking horses and bulls buck. And uh, one day, I just decided I wanted to kind of jump on one so um, a friend of mine's named Arthur Stoner um, we had a, they had a play day over at Oklahoma City East Side and Arthur Stoner they had a junior bull riding and so Stoney put me on we call him Stoney he put me on a, a bull and I went to the truck and asked my grandpa for ten dollars and he gave me a glove and my grandma my grandma gave me ten dollars my grandpa gave me a glove and I went and rode a bull down a, down the pen and ever since then I've been hooked I'm a country boy I'm a cowboy so coming up from, you know, a kid on, you know, I've always been around horses. I just didn't do this when I got grown. I was raised up in it. So that's just like, you know, you ask telling me that I'm far from my job and I'm my own self-employee. You know, so that's, you know, I, I love rodeo and I love horses. I love, I love animals. The, you know, the toughest thing about rodeo is getting to them. Competing is the easiest thing. Just getting to them across around the world. You know, um, I've been to Canada a bunch, been to Brazil on the USA team, um, Sydney, Australia, you know, so I've been around the world, you know, doing this and it's, it's my love. You know, I've always said it will be the death of me, but you know, who knows these days. Irvin Williams is a world champion bull rider. He won his first place championship in the National Finals Rodeo before a capacity crowd in Las Vegas, Nevada in 1989. He's also the National Finals Rodeo three-time runner-up. I grew up uh, in uh, 
little town called Grace in Oklahoma. And my father used to put on little rodeos. And I used, I think my father wanted me to rope mostly, but you know, I kept on falling off the horse. So I, I started riding bulls. Well, I went to the national finals three times and I won Cheyenne Frontier Days. I think, you know, I was looking back and uh, uh, I won Oak Muggy, uh, the 48th year of it. And I was looking at my, I ain't seen it since about 20, 20 years. And I thought that jacket was better than me uh, when making it to the national finals or the uh, Cheyenne Frontier. I wear many hats at the Clearview Rodeo. Currently, me and my family, we own the rodeo grounds. It was built and founded by my father, Romeo James Alford Sr. And, but it was with the help of his family and the community that the Clearview Rodeo was founded and built. It's still fun, okay, but now it is seriously competitive and, and they've gotten it down to a science they practice, whereas in the early years they would show up on the weekend and, you know, and have a, a good time. But now uh, a guy used to say there was uh, farm boys on plow horses. Now you have athletes on race horses. O.J. Thomas is a rodeo photographer He's one of a kind. Most people know him as Fly Thomas. He is the first black rodeo photographer in the world. He's also the first black professional rodeo cowboy association photographer and the first black international professional cowboy association photographer. Rodeo photos are his specialty. Fly Thomas wasn't always a photographer. His love for the arena started some time ago. Today, Fly Thomas' photos are all over the country. I rode bulls for years and years, but uh, after my daughter was born, I said, I can't keep doing this. But I had, it was burning to my heart, rodeo was. And when my daughter was born, I said, I got to find out. And the last bull I got on was in Clinton, Oklahoma. The way I learned photography, I was in Vietnam. And uh, we went to a village that ran uh, Barricat, in Barricat area. I was the first half. And I seen this man take a picture. And when we, we had went on patrol, when I came back through, he showed me a picture of me. Said, wow, how you do that? I'm a country boy. I don't know nothing about photography. And I kind of start like, man, I like this. And we, I start, you know, seeing this uh, Vietnamese man. And uh, after he showed me that pitch, man, it's just something burning in my heart. Like, man, I, that's nice. But I didn't pursue it. I just kind of stayed away from it. But I shoot a profession, and I've been shooting professional rodeos for years. For year. My first cover in the, in the professional rodeo was Gowan, Oklahoma. I shot that rodeo. And uh, I had to cover, and man, it's just been great the way they they uh, they treated me. Everybody in the PRSA treat me good. I never had any problems doing what I'm doing today. The the to be the first African American photographer in the pros. That's what makes me really feel good. <laughs>